All right, people, let's rock and roll. Yeah, welcome to Simply Cyber. Today is Thursday, March 2nd, 2023. Holla at you. Welcome to Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing, episode number 314. For those math lovers out there, 3.14, it's a pie episode. This is just breaking news to me now, right now. Uh, coincidentally, I did teach crypto today at the Citadel, so it seems like everything is adding up. Oh my God. Thank you for joining. In the next 45 minutes, me, Amanu Boss, Stephen Kell, Greg Does Stuff, Lifestyle with Joyce, Local Ken, Tom Bishop, and so many more are going to be shredding the top cybersecurity news stories of the day. I'm Dr. Gerald Dozier. I'll be providing my expert analysis on each of those stories on what it means to you as a practitioner. So how can you operationalize this at work next week in the macro Q4 planning? Whatever it is that you need to do, we're going to be helping you out with that. Also, if you are looking to break in the industry, you just graduated college, or you're about to, you're pivoting because you hate your job and you want to get into this hotness that is cybersecurity. You're transitioning out of the military. Doesn't matter what your story is. There's a place for you in cybersecurity. And being here is going to give you access to the network of people, the terminology, the concepts, and the top stories, which are basically really about the top threats that you need to be mindful of. You're going to get it here. So settle in, buckle up. It's going to be a good one before we shred this hotness. I want to say what's up. Thank you to my friends, the stream sponsors. They make it. You might not. You might have noticed there were no ads when you dropped in here. Do you know why? Because we don't run ads on this thing. We have sponsors, people in the community who kick butt. What's up, Jojo? Good morning, Gerald and family. If you know anyone higher in GRC remote, holla at you. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Thank you so much for the super chat, Jojo. Um, guys, I want to introduce you to Barricade Cyber Solutions. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks. Not only do they kick a mud hole in your organization, they can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners, aka your boss, into turmoil. But Barricade Cyber Solutions knows how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. Check them out at barricadecyber.com. Links in the description below. We are currently looking at barricadecyber.com. I want to call out my man, Eric Taylor. This guy, he's a treasure. He's a community member. He knows what he's talking about. He deals with threat actors regularly. You can get on his schedule as simple as two mouse clicks. What does it get you if you're on his schedule? Well, it allows you to have an open conversation. Don't be intimidated. Don't be like, uh, like imposter syndrome. It doesn't matter. Dude, if you don't have a plan to handle what happens if a threat actor gets in your environment and starts, you know, basically extorting you or, or ransom, anything like that, you want to have somebody who can help you with the quickness. This is what Barricade Cyber does. Give them a call. Just explore the conversation, right? It doesn't cost anything to have a conversation. Plus, Eric Taylor, uh, he doesn't bite. That might cost extra, but by default, he doesn't bite. I also want to introduce and welcome you guys to Panopsi Security uh, Sponsor. This is Brandon Poole's company. Brandon Poole from the great state of South Carolina. The man knows what he's doing. One of the services that Brandon wants you to know about is quantified, quantified risk assessments. Panopsi brings quantified risk assessment um, capabilities to your organization. Why would you want to do that? What's a barricade cyber with the gifted sub? Giddy up on those gifted what? subs. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Grab those gifted subs. Al Downing, Funky Monk, GB or Mike B picking up those spots. Definitely take advantage of the custom emotes. Uh, new squad members. Thank you so much, Eric Taylor. Guys, Brandon Pool's company, Panopsi. Like in the world of GRC, there are risk assessments. Risk assessments inform where you're supposed to invest your money, where your priorities are, where your biggest weaknesses are. R risk assessments is how you actually have confidence in what you're doing is the greatest risk reduction, the greatest value for your business. It starts with a risk assessment. Now you can do a subjective qualified risk assessment, which is what I teach in the GRC course, or you could take it to the next level, the steroids version is a quantified risk assessment and that's what Brandon Poole can offer you. So if you're an organization, maybe you're a, a one person shop, maybe you're Matrix, right? Like BSEC, maybe you're Matrix. Hold on, you slow down there. Slow down. 
what you would want to do is have a risk assessment done by Panopsi, and they will tell you all of the highest value areas to invest your time, money, energy, and efforts. Okay. So that's what Panopsi is doing. Go check them out at panopsi.com. Links in the description below. Also, obviously, IT Pro TV, big fan of them. If you're a veteran, you can get 60% off at IT Pro TV. If you're a Simply Cyber community member, you can get 30% off. You cannot, you cannot stack those, right? You can you get like 110% off, and IT Pro TV is paying you to do that. <laughs> that would be something. All right, guys. Um, it is What's Your Meme Thursday. We do have the Simply Cyber Community Challenge rolling. We're a couple minutes in, but I want to get to the top news of the day. I'd like to thank all of you for being here. Nick Barker, Left Coast people enjoying the 10 a.m. Eastern slot. William Welch, Roman Charleston. Hey, Roman Charleston, thank you for that. So uh, Roman Charleston just notified us that if you're a student uh, in university, K through 12, whatever, you can get 50% off at IT Pro TV. The, 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 the greatness that is IT Pro TV continues to surprise me. Like the quality is great. The deals are great. Working with them as an affiliate is great. The people are great. I'm all in on IT Pro TV. I think I, I need to get an IT Pro TV shirt. That's what I need now. I'm like, I'm like that into IT Pro TV. So this is cool. Thanks for sharing that, Roman. We are all here to help each other. And that's a great example of network sharing. Jeez, I love it. All right, guys. I want to get to the news so we can get to the mid-roll so we can get to the jaw jacking. Sit back, relax, and let the cool sounds of the top cyber news stories wash over you in an awesome wave. I'll see you guys at the mid-roll. It's Thursday, March 2nd, 2023. Russia bans foreign private messaging apps. The country's internet watchdog agency Roskomnadzor warned that what? new laws we went into effect friends, prohibiting yep. organizations in Russia from using foreign-owned information exchange systems. The regulator specifically mentioned Discord, Microsoft Teams, Snapchat, Telegram, and WhatsApp as falling under this ban. This comes as the country also began trying to promote domestic software, offering incentives to organizations that use Russian Linux distributions like Astra Linux and Red OS. Okay. All right, a couple things here. Get your tinfoil hat on because I this uh, uh, Eric Taylor dropped this in Discord yesterday and I had some initial thoughts. So here's the deal. Russia as a country has banned use of foreign messaging apps. Very popular ones. Microsoft Teams, Threema, Telegram. OK, these are ones that we all know and they're banning them now. Like, let's let's not cast stones against Russia. The United States has banned TikTok. Um, from government organizations and, and Trudeau and, and Canada and the UK, um, they're all moving towards banning TikTok. So like the idea of banning apps in the government is not uh, unfound territory. OK, now what is really interesting to me is that Russia is obviously doing this in order to um, they must suspect that there are leaks or backdoors or espionage capabilities inside of these messaging apps. And by by banning them. They're effectively removing their <laughs> to take this to a GRC bend as it pops into my mind. There's three ways to deal with risk, right? You can mitigate it, you can transfer it, or you can fully eliminate it, right? And there's a fourth one. Um, you can accept it, right? Which is whatever. So fully removing it, th the risk of espionage is what they're doing here by banning these apps. Now, uh, like as a LOL. I noticed that they didn't put Tinder on here, which if you remember at the onset of the Ukrainian conflict, um, they had moved a bunch of troops to the top left of um, of Ukraine. And the soldiers there were like all up on Tinder <laughs> trying to hook up with like locals. And it tipped off to the Ukraine that there was an entire force up there. So really bad OPSEC. That was a h hilarious uh, case study of bad OPSEC uh, disclosing your troop positions. But anyways, um, so it's no surprise that they're doing this, okay? It is a way for them to manage the risk of um, espionage and military secrets and stuff like that. Now, here is the tinfoil hat, Jerry, okay? Very interesting. There are two things that do not appear on this uh, list, okay? Jeez Louise with the super chat. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Thanks so much for the support in the channel and for the super chat. There was another super chat. Lifestyle. Um, lifestyle with. Hold on. Let me let me get this whole name. L lifestyle with Joyce. 
Yeah, Lifestyle with Joyce. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Thank you so much to, to everybody, the whole the whole chat. But, you know, for the super chats, I genuinely appreciate it. It helps it helps keep the show, you know, free to everybody. So, um, two things. Tinfoil hat, Jerry. Thank you, Jai. Thank you, Omatola. It's about to come, Funky Monk. Zoom is not on here. And Signal. Now, let's address Signal because that's the easy one. Signal, we just saw yesterday, the CEO of Signal was like, a thousand percent, I will pull out of a market before I allow a weaker encryption to be implemented. So suck it, suck it, suck it. So Signal is all in on privacy. You're not going to get a compromise on Signal. So I would, I would suspect, honestly, that Russia is probably using Signal because it is so effective at securing communications. Now, here's the tinfoil hat, y'all. <laughs> Zoom is not on the list. The second I saw this, my immediate thought was, well, Russia's got, a, Russia's got um, a, a, an intrusion on Zoom. Like, why else would Zoom, of all platforms, it is widely used, it's, it's used in the United States all over the place. If they're going to ban Skype for Business and Microsoft Teams, which is a competitor to Zoom, why would they not ban Zoom unless unless there was some military or geopolitical advantage for Russia to use Zoom? Because, dude, if Russia is saying that they want they're incentivizing people to use Russian based softwares, I, I don't know. But I would bet money that matters to me that there is a Russian based version of some teleconferencing solution that could be used in place of Zoom. OK. So it's not like Zoom's cornered the market and Russia has to accept it. So the only explanation to me is that Russia's got some some insight into Zoom and they don't they don't want to ban it. OK, that's a tinfoil ad. Who really knows? I don't know. Um, but it just seems weird, especially since Zoom is based out of California. It's a U.S. based company. You could easily imagine the United States federal government leaning on Zoom and being like, hey, it's a matter of national security. Be a patriot. Give us a back door to all meetings or, or recordings of all meetings that occur in a Russian IP space. Just saying, okay? Uh, can Russia have insight into Signal? So Michael Fink asks, can Russia have insight into Signal? Possibly, but I, I feel like Signal has had massive amounts of um, analysis done. And there is a, um, oh my God, there's a guy, he's got a really interesting name. It's like very unusual. And he like he's like looked at Signal early on, or he he has studied Signal, or he works with Signal that had like basically established legitimate credibility that Signal was effectively unbreakable uh, from its end-to-end -end encryption. I wish I could remember his name. It's like Spearhaven or um, something like that. Uh, Zoom is restricted in Ukraine, Jerry. Very nice, interesting. Uh, Zoom was not U.S. based at its origin. Interesting. Okay, this is good stuff. I, I see. I, I get to learn too, uh, as well. I wish I could remember that guy's name. Signal, uh, signal, um, researcher. Uh, oh, what was his name? Um, oh my God. Um, Crackhaven. No. What was his name? Damn, it's gonna bother me. He's got a really interesting name. Um, it'll come to me later. All right, let's keep rolling. But this is this is interesting. Like softwares are being banned here, there, and everywhere. GitHub expands secret scanning. I'm saying, so Greg, Signal is not, nothing's bulletproof. You always have some risk, right? But Signal is very, very good at encryption, right? Um, encrypting the communication channels. I, I haven't studied Signal. Like the app itself might have a software vulnerability. I don't know. Um, nothing, nothing in our world is bulletproof. Okay. That's a fact. Oh, and I'm just, I'm getting, uh, this is just coming in right now from Eric Taylor. Uh, this is back in 2020. So this is several years old. Zoom got mistakenly routed through China. So there is, uh, it, you know, mistakenly is in quotes. So there has been instances of kind of man in the middle attacks, if you will, uh, encryption, you know, if you're using AES-256, it's it's supposedly unbreakable, but, you know, th there's all sorts of attacks. And Moxie Marla Spike, thank you, Tom Bishop. Yes, that is what I'm talking about. Moxie Marley Spike. Um, 
I, I try not to get too deep into the crypto world, but this guy right here, he was definitely involved with Signal, definitely involved in setting it up to be um, secure, and he's well-respected in the crypto space. So that's that. Okay, let's keep rolling. Back in December, GitHub introduced a beta for a free secret scanning feature on public repositories. Within the test, 70,000 public repositories enabled it. Now, GitHub announced the service is publicly available. This will look at API keys, passwords, tokens, and other confidential information left in code. As part of this, GitHub will also notify its service partners if it detects their secrets left in public code, letting them revoke tokens and notify impacted customers. Admins need to opt into the feature available in the settings tab. Interesting. Boot okay, so a couple things here. Um, this th There's been a major uh, movement over the last couple of years, guys, and hopefully you've been seeing it. I've talked about it on the stream a couple of times. Um, open source software is, uh, it, there's security issues, right? Log4j kind of lit the lit the fire for people to to get into this right like three developers volunteering time the the code gets baked in everywhere and then all of a sudden um a major major vulnerability is discovered and people are like oh my god so the u.s government public private sector relationship um ha they've committed millions of dollars millions of human uh or like w man hours woman hours whatever you want to call it um time effort energy money focus on helping secure open source software. And Microsoft owns GitHub, remember, and Microsoft is doing good work as far as like, in, you know, pushing the envelope on security. So this GitHub's secret scanning alert, and I just wanna be clear to everybody, this isn't like some undercover black ops scanning alert. It's literally looking for secrets. It's looking for passwords. It's looking for API keys. It's looking for things that you would not want public Okay, that's what the secret is. So it's a it's a secret scanning tool, not a secret scanning tool. Okay, words matter, punctuation matters. Uh, all my uh, English people out there, high five. Okay, so this alert thing, they tested it. It looks like it's ready for public consumption. I have a GitHub repo. Many of us have GitHub repos. Um, I would love to try this out. I might make a little video on it. Um, I'm not sure how it's used. Um, <laughs> I'm, I hope it's only available to scan your own things because they said you can also notify partners that they have exposed secrets. But clearly, if a threat actor is able to use this, it would, lim it would reduce significantly the amount of time it takes for them to find um, you know, secrets that have been accidentally publicly disclosed by people. Okay, so this tool obviously is wicked powerful for defending but obviously it would be pretty powerful for threat actors it would reduce the bar script kitties could move faster etc cetera, etc cetera. um i'm interested in this i'm going to take a note right now uh on investigating this and maybe making a video on that i've been trying to make more videos that are more interesting to people but then occasionally something like this comes up and i'm like i want to do this even though like a, probably a small portion of people would actually care about it um all right, I took a note here to, to follow up on that. Okay. It bypasses Secure Boot. Researchers at Asset report that the Eufy bootkit known as Black Lotus became the first malware confirmed as able to bypass Secure Boot on Windows 11. It found it was able to run on fully up-to-date systems. Black Lotus could allow an attacker full control over the OS boot process, opening the door to deploying arbitrary payloads at startup. Kaspersky researchers first discovered Black Lotus back in October, and it remains available for sale for $5,000. Attackers use legitimate drivers with known security vulnerabilities to install Black Lotus initially. After a first reboot, it gains persistence. Bill. Okay, so really quick, Black Lotus, where are my Magic the Gathering people at? I'm talking about a freaking Black Lotus, man. Okay, so basically Eufy uh, boots, Eufy is, um, and I'm not an expert on this, but basically it's like an additional firmware past the BIOS that allows you um, to, to do secure stuff, right? Like trusted computing platform. Um, okay, so someone has come up with some type of bootkit malware. The thing is you have to install it on the, uh, the, you have to compromise the asset first, then install it. Then once you reboot it, it basically loads before the boot uh, system loads up. So this is about 
as root kit as root kit gets. Okay, it's root kitty. So uh, if your machine gets popped with this, you're screwed. Okay, I don't even know how you remove this uh, because it's it's in the UEFI. It's like you if you re-image Windows, the machine is still owned. Like you'd have to re-image the UEFI firmware, and good luck discovering that um, that you've even got that. Uh, compromise and happen. It says stealthy um, boot kit. I, I'm kind of curious how they found this, honestly. So ESET, if you guys don't know, ESET, I feel like ESET doesn't get a um, enough press or enough love. ESET is very, very good at doing security research, okay? Let me pull this up. I talk about Cisco Talos and um, like Google Tag and stuff like that, but ESET, ESET has dropped some like real bombs in the in the way of like you know new research ncc group also very good at writing new um research um i guess it's for sale five thousand dollars so this is more of a criminal operation less of a um excuse me less of a um geopolitical one although military states nation states they could use this as well i'm kind of curious Honestly, how does it get into your machine initially, right? Like, you know, here, here it is. Um, uh, deploys bootkit and reboots machine. Executed only on first system start. So starts vulnerable. Oh, okay. So basically, basically what it looks like here to me is that it, it, it kind of puts a different firmware on your machine and essentially, or you know, like... It runs like a firmware. That's kind of what I'm seeing here. So you've got this firmware that it runs, establishes a persistent mechanism. It enrolls the attacker's key into the list of trusted keys. Then the legitimate firmware boots up. UEFI looks at the key list, sees the attacker key, and off you're running. Yeah, so this sucks. Um, I guess an indicator of compromise would be that the an additional key or an attacker key would be in the NVRAM, although you don't have an easy way to look at RAM, honestly. Um, I would imagine that Windows is going to uh, release some type of tool that would somehow look at the boot process to determine if there is, um, a, you know, a recent key added or something like that. I don't know how you solve for this one, but this is pretty sketchy. Um, if you're a student looking to learn, hell, even if you're a professional looking to learn, this is a pretty well-documented, pretty sophisticated, I mean, like when we talk about sophisticated, this is about this is about as sophisticated as you're gonna get. Like this is really well done. Uh, so nice job with ESET, uh, dude. For only five thousand bucks, you too can compromise someone's um, bootloader and get persistence on them. Five thousand might sound like a lot of money, but dude, if you install it on like a CEO's machine or a CFO's machine, you'll always be in their machine. They will never get rid of you. Okay. Oh, okay. So we see here you can look at the. Um, the Windows Boot Manager, and you will actually detect a modified uh, path for the bootloader. So the the classic one is Winload EFI. The manipulated one is Boot Manager EFI. All right. So good good news. This is um, this is definitely a great case study for individuals looking to study how malware execution would really work in a practical setting. This is a really nice, elegant, well documented blog post. Uh, not good for us as practitioners. Be mindful of this. Uh, definitely <laughs> let your let your staff know regularly about best practices, and um, you may want to do some research on your own on how Microsoft is going to help people detect this. Give Biden power to block TikTok. TikTok. The U.S. recently moved to forbid TikTok on government devices, with Canada following suit. While it Hold on. Carrie's saying that Windows Defender can scan UEFI. Let's check that out. Hold on. I know um, some people in the community poo-poo on... Some people poo-poo on Windows Defender. Uh, I'm looking this up right now. UFEI scanner brings Microsoft Defender protection to a new level. This is from 2020. So this is a few years old. Um, Anti-rootkit, which is good, which is good. Um, looks like it's baked in nicely. It does look at NVRAM, which is what I was just telling you about. Um, and me, NVB non-volatile, so it, it doesn't go away. You guys, oh my God. Guys, I'm I'm shooting from the hip over here. I always do these streams live in front of you. And I got I got the mods 
lighten me up over here. Um, so thank you for all for the fact checking. I do appreciate it. So make sure that, I guess what I would say is make sure your EDR, whether it's Microsoft Defender or not, is detecting or scanning UAFI. And yes, if you're digital forensics incident responder, you will have tools that look at RAM and memory, but that's a post compromise. You already know it's compromised and you're analyzing it at that point. All right. Thank you guys. Casey Gasco, what's up? Base case. It's unclear if the U.S. will follow India in a nationwide block of the app. Legislators moved a step closer to making that action a little easier. The U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee voted in favor of the Deterring America's Technological Adversaries Act, which passed on a fully partisan Republican vote. The act gives President Biden the power to block TikTok. It remains unclear if the bill will become law and needs to pass the Senate and the rest of the House. Given the partisan committee vote, it could face issues. And now. All right. I mean, this isn't like the ban TikTok bill. This is a much wider bill. So I'd actually, I mean, I get it. Let's ban TikTok. I'm, I'm totally into that. Like, let's do it. I'm, I'm all in. But I'm curious, like, Deterring America's Technological Adversaries, the Data Act. Dude, the U.S. military and the U.S. government, they love themselves some some backronyms. You know, they were like, let's call it the Data Act. Well, then what would data stand for? I don't know. Let's figure it out. Um, I wonder what that gives the president. So the president is one person. So if they get the power to ban things unilaterally, it is interesting. Like, what does that mean? Like, yeah, obviously banning TikTok. We have good, you know, information on that. But maybe... <laughs> maybe after presidency, you're going to go into private sector and wouldn't it be nice to ban Facebook, you know what I mean? Or ban Twitter, you know, unless Elon hooks you up. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm being a little speculative and a little playfully humorous, but um, my point is I'm kind of curious um, what this bill fully entails. I, I would assume that this is going to go forward. Guys, TikTok's been all up in the, in the news. Uh, there's all sorts of things with it. We've seen it banned in Canada. Um, the U.S. has... Banned it. Um, as far as I know, it was banned in federal IT. So I don't know if this is going to ban it like to U.S. citizens, maybe. I don't know. But um, yeah, see, the government has taken the precaution of banning the app on government issued devices. Several state governments have done the same. So is this, hold on, is this a law to ban it in the United States? Wow, this is actually different than what I thought. This is going to be uh, quite a um, quite a precedent to set, right? Like, you're, the federal government's going to tell private citizens that they can't they can't use an app. Very interesting. Very interesting. People are going to be pissed. A lot of <laughs> a lot of users on TikTok. A lot some people making money off TikTok to pay their bills. You're going to ban it, huh? Hmm. Interesting. Let's bring back GeoCities. <laughs> A word from our sponsor, Conveyor. I hate security questionnaires with the fury of a thousand suns, said one of Conveyor's customers. It makes sense since tools used to answer them haven't changed in years. At Conveyor, they're on a mission to get teams out of the questionnaire stone age by implementing GPT-3 into their first of its kind questionnaire eliminator. Go beyond rewriting mediocre matches to getting your questionnaire autofilled with the exact answers customers need. Join the top SaaS companies in the GPT-3 powered future by using Conveyor. Learn more at conveyor.com. TikTok. All right. Whoa, hold on now, bro. It's the mid-roll. Don't get don't get don't get going like that, Steve Prentice. All right, guys. Wanna say hi. Shout out. Thanks. We have a great, great show today. It's been going very well. I've been I've been making mistakes and being held accountable up here, which I genuinely appreciate. I might be up here on stage, but I'm, I'm just a practitioner the same as you. Uh, I want to thank Barricade Cyber Solutions, Panopsi, for the continued stream support. I'd love to thank all of you uh, for being here today and making this community uh, as in unbelievably impressive and valuable as it is. Like, you guys, the value, you know what? Like a, a phone by itself isn't useful. The power of a phone is that the network, everybody else owns a phone and you can call someone. So the power of the value of something, the power of something, it, it it's directly correlates to how large the network is. And you guys are the network. I'm part of the network. 
you guys make Simply Cyber so incredibly valuable and so incredibly useful and a utility to so many in our community. I genuinely appreciate you showing up every day, you, you, you commenting in chat, you helping each other out. We do great work and I'm, I'm genuinely appreciative of all of you. If you're getting educational value, entertainment value out of the stream, take a hot second, hit the like button. It does go a long way and I appreciate it. If you wanna get an email from me on Monday with like basically three different uh, ways to reduce cyber risk at your organization, it's a fresh email every single week. I write it on Saturday, I do it, I send it to you. It's, it's, it's part of my mentoring at scale efforts. So if you want to get some of that value, giddy up on it, sign up. If you don't like it, unsubscribe. That's cool. It is Thursday, so it's What's Your Memes Thursday. Haircut Fish could not be with us today, but he did drop a meme. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what this is, so I'm going to have to rely on chat for this. But here's the stream. I mean, here's the meme. I, I, and I think I'm going to read it like the JG Wentworth ad. I have a vulnerability, but I need GRC now. Call Jerry Osher, 877-INFOSEC now. Now, I don't know what this picture is naturally, but yesterday, many of you were at the Anti-Siphon Conference, and many of you, and I appreciate this, attended my talk at that conference. Chat was blowing up, Discord was blowing up. We had a really great time with that talk. And somewhere during my talk, I made a JG Wentworth reference. I don't even remember, uh, honestly. And I think that this is what it is uh, related to. Um, uh, yeah, so anyways, thank you so much to Haircut Fish for the continued support. Uh, Dan's been going strong with the memes for months now, and I and I genuinely appreciate that. I love you too, Ben. Thank you. All right, guys, it's time for the Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Jack Scott held the baton yesterday, and she crushed it with her... Uh, she was wearing the Simply Cyber crop top. She was dancing. She was giving value to our community. I hope all of you reached out and connected with her, but it's time for Jack's to hand the baton off and tag someone else. I genuinely hope Jax is in chat. Jax, if you can tag someone, whoever gets tagged by Jax, it's the Simply Cyber Community Challenge. If you're up for it, drop um, Jax picks Chinadu. All right, Chinadu, thanks, Kimberly. So Chinadu, if you are, if you are up for the challenge, Chinadu, please accept the challenge in chat right now. Go on LinkedIn. Share what it is about cybersecurity or Simply Cyber or anything that gives value or, or contribute value to the community. And I ask all of you in chat, the 169 of you are here, all those watching on replay, go on LinkedIn, connect with Chinadu on that post. Anyone in the comments that is not a first connection, connect with them, right? This is an opportunity to build our networks. If you're introverted, if you're not sure how to do networking, this is a great first step to break free and start doing the networking that is so incredibly valuable. All right? So Chinadu, uh, Kimberly, if you can help me, uh, just keep an eye out for Chinadu and her accepting that um, responsibility. So Team Replay is gonna get involved. I will share that on the jawjacking section uh, of the stream, so stay tuned for that. We gotta get back in though. The uh, Simple Minds has ended. Thanks, Base Case, for the reminder. ...ons to security concerns. Of course, the reason TikTok faces bans on government devices comes over perceived cybersecurity concerns. TikTok responded to three of these concerns in a recent BBC piece. In response to claims that TikTok collects excessive amounts of data, it pointed to tests from Citizen Lab and the Georgia Institute of Technology that found its data collection in line with other social media apps. It collects a lot, but so does everyone else. The company also insists that U.S. user data is stored in the U.S. and Singapore rather than in mainland China, with plans to have EU and U.K. data processing done in Ireland by 2024. On allegations of censorship or using it to feed into influence operations, a Citizen Lab comparison between TikTok and ByteDance's China-specific Doyin app found it did not deploy the same level of political censorship. The BBC says fears about the app come down to theoretical risks. But it notes that since Western apps remain largely banned in China, this represents a one-way risk. All right. So this is interesting. <clears throat> so <clears throat> TikTok's being banned. Uh, we just talked about the U.S. government passing a law to allow Biden to ban it. Um, Canada's banned it. U the U.K. is, is uh, flexing on it a little bit. Uh, so TikTok tries to address this head on. The three main concerns. They collect an excessive amount of data. They, 
they um <clears throat> what's hilarious is they basically said this is true but we don't do it any more than anyone else does and i don't see you complaining about meta and amazon's collection processes so we're not bad we're 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 just doing the same thing everyone else is doing okay so this one they straight up <laughs> admit it okay that's fine second of all tiktok could be used to, uh, to be to spy from the chinese government now they say that uh, according to them, the Chinese government's not involved and they wouldn't allow them to look at anything. I mean, I hate to sound like a, a naysayer, but if we've looked at um, history, right? Like look at, I don't know, Alibaba, probably one of the largest companies in China, like didn't tow the company line and they got uh, slapped. Um, there was a company in China that like, I forget exactly. Oh, they, they like listed themselves. And again, I'm sorry, I can't remember the company right now, but like they listed themselves on like the New York Stock Exchange. And all of a sudden they had massive problems in China and then they pulled themselves off the stock exchange. And then after a couple months, China like allowed them to be back in business after appointing a government official to their board. Okay. So for TikTok to say this, yeah, I think there's a lot of like uh, interpretation being done here. And obviously, it's it's fine to say we wouldn't allow anything like we wouldn't if we were asked. But, uh, you know, if push comes to shove, I, I, I don't know if I necessarily believe that based on case study. OK. Finally, they said it could be a brainwashing tool, which I've railed against this one. Right. I've read reports again. I didn't fact check this, but I've read reports that say, like, you know, TikTok in the U.S. pushes a lot of like edu um, entertainment kind of mind you know, chill out type content, not really adding value. Whereas TikTok in other countries like China, uh, it, it, it uses the algorithm to push educational content to younger audiences, right? So, you know, it's a long play, but you're, you're presumably suggesting that um, people are getting smarter at younger ages in one area of the world and people are not getting smarter in one area of the world. Okay. So I haven't done this level of investigation, uh, but, you know, it, it said it could be used as a brainwashing tool. Um, I mean, brainwashing is kind of a strong word, but if we saw what how Facebook was weaponized uh, during the 2016 election and the fallout from the Cambridge Analytica documentary, which you can go watch on Netflix called The Great Hack, um, and what they did with Brexit, what they did with Trinidad Tobago, um, yes, you're not going to get like Manchurian candidates running around just, you know, blindly executing whatever they want. This isn't the last of us where TikTok is like a fungus and it's just going to take over what your decision-making process is. But I think it could be used like any other application to sway public opinion, to stoke emotional fires. Okay. So I, I just want to point out really quickly, the fact that the U S federal government is about to potentially pass a law that would give the president the ability to ban this app, I, you know, it makes me think that the intelligence community, right, that the classified information, like they must know or have something around all this stuff because the president banning an app, it's not because he didn't get a blue check mark and he's pissy, right? It's because there's likely national security concerns, right? You don't go to that level of effort for like for 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 theater it, it wouldn't make any sense it's not it's not with all due respect it's not worth and i don't care which side of the aisle you're on it's not worth the president of the united states time to look at this and make a decision like that unless there was real real intel behind the 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 priority of it frankly so you know we'll see where this goes okay mobile fishing explodes in 2022 According to a new report from Lookout, 2022 saw the highest rate of mobile phishing ever. It found half of all personal mobile phone users globally experienced a phishing attack at least once every quarter. The percentage of users experiencing attacks increased on the year every quarter since Q2 2020. On professional devices, phishing attacks increased about 10% since 2021, with the insurance, financial, and healthcare industries more specifically targeted. It seems malicious actors also got better at crafting messages for click-through. The report found that in 2020, only 1.6% of mobile enterprise users clicked on six or more malicious links within a year. By 2022, that had jumped to 11.8%. How to integrate... Okay, so <clears throat> a couple things here. Um, one, guys, if, if, if any of you have gotten a message from like... 
you know, like Linda wanting to know if you're still on for coffee at two o'clock today, if you got that text message or, oh, I had a great time golfing with you. Like, like love to hang out. Like those pig butchering scam emails. If you've gotten a phishing email, right? When they say mobile phishing, I mean, you get your email on your phone. It's very difficult. You can't hover over a link. It's very difficult to like validate and do kind of the normal things that we would do. Um, on a on a desktop or laptop to to check this thing and threat actors know it guys threat actors they are not stupid like when they launch attacks and they notice that like oh these ones are working more than these ones right they're going to do more of the ones that are working and less of the ones that are not working and if mobile if mobile phishing is more successful they're going to lean into it right byo devices yes you're not running edr on your Android phone probably, right? So there's a, there's less tech, there's less security tech available to protect your end users from themselves. Cool. Also, they mentioned down here that non-email based phishing attacks like uh, vishing, which you don't really see that much, smishing, QR code phishing has increased seven fold in the second quarter, right? Dude, threat actors are going to, are going to, Threat actors are gonna are gonna fraud it up, guys. If it whatever works, they're gonna fraud it. Um, I was just talking to my very close friend last night, and he told me that he got a voicemail. <clears throat> it said, uh, "This is a call from your 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 bank. Your Visa or Mastercard has been compromised." <laughs> it's like he's like, "Oh my god, these guys are terrible with their frauds." So, anyways, um, just be mindful. This is this is very likely going to be my. Um, newsletter tip of the week or whatever for your end users like dude if if mobile phishing has gone up statistically sevenfold uh in the last year this means that there's a much higher percentage that your end users your carls your vendors who have insider access to your networks your executives your your, your end users who have kids who let their kids use their work machines, or if you were doing like BYOD and you're allowing people to use their own laptops or their own work computer at home workstations that their kids also do stuff on, um, you got to make them mindful because this 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 is um this is an area of focus, right? And I know it's mobile, but like who doesn't give their kid their phone from time to time, right? So just be mindful, okay? Gen Z into a security program. We know there is a glaring cybersecurity skill shortage, so how to bring young people into the field remains a known problem. CISO Online's Merrill Vernon recently looked at how organizations can better work with this younger generation. One of the things the report found was that Gen Z employees can be eager to learn new skills, but also want to move forward quickly to new challenges. Employers should lean into that to help deal with the fast-changing threats in cybersecurity. These younger employees also greatly prefer electronic communications, even when in speaking distance, so it recommends using this to promote the creation of tight-knit, highly dispersed teams. All right. So this is a good one. All right. Where are my Gen Zs at? If you were born between 1990 and 2010, you know, stand up or shout out or whatever you want to say in chat. Uh, you are all you are all welcome here. Gen Z. Gen X, Millennial, Boomer, if you're up in here, Gen Alpha or whatever you guys are called, Gen Ones, whatever. Greatest generations. You're all you're all here, right? Everybody matters. Okay, so I'm gonna flip the script here. Because I know a lot of people are like, oh my God, millennials, Gen Z, like you're so entitled, like you didn't earn anything. Okay, here's the deal. Get off your high horse. Not Gen Z, like like you in general. Like I don't care what generation you are. Get off your high horse and and really think about this, okay? If your if you are responsible for an information security program, okay? Let let's just play a game here because this I've done this. This is important. If you are working at an information security organization right now. By the way, if you're looking to break in, this is actually going to be a really, really awesome um, tip or pro tip or whatever. This is something you could bust out in an interview that is going to blow minds, okay? Really quick. Now, if you work at an organization and you're doing information security awareness, 
or you're doing any type SOC analyst differ and you need to talk to the end users, the business, okay? This is a real thing. Different people communicate differently. And I don't care if you're a kind of person who really likes to talk on the phone or you really like to send email, whatever it is, Gen Z, like I like texting. Texting's like my preferred medium. Gen Z likes texting. Gen Z likes Discord and, and, and Slack and stuff like that, right? Like meeting in person, even if you're meeting in person, you know, like, yeah, you can have a conversation and stuff like that. But that's not the preferred communication vehicle, all right? Now, it's not like conform to me. Remember, as information security professionals, we are tasked with many things, but also with educating our end users and modifying their behavior to be less cyber risky. That is the challenge. That's the charge that we have. Now, if Gen Z prefers electronic communication, then you are an a-hole if you're like, no, the way I do it is in-person meetings. That's how it's going to be. You're going to drag them kicking and screaming. You need to meet them and deliver and communicate effective information security is, uh, awareness through a medium that speaks to them. So guess what? I'm sorry it's extra work, but you need to go in person and speak to the people who are older that prefer that medium. Then you need to craft an email and send it out. You might have a thousand person organization, 200 people are going to read the email. That's fine. Then guess what? Have a Slack channel, have a Discord channel, have whatever, and post the messages there. Also, you got a kiosk that rotates or whatever, put some awareness training there. You need to hit these people, your end user audience, from all different factors. If all you're doing is sending an email out and then you're complaining about the efficacy of your security program and how the end users, like I've heard people say before, like, oh my God, like the program would be so good if I just didn't have to deal with end users. It's like, do you understand that you're actually saying that you're not doing your job well? That's what I'm hearing you say. It is not the end user's responsibility to in, like ingest your messaging in the medium that you like. It is your responsibility to deliver the message in a medium that is effective for your end users. And that's a key distinction. And it's a key that you can use to unlock effective information security awareness training. This outlines it perfectly. This is statistical evidence that identifies this is how Gen Z wants to speak. And you need to hit them with that. Plus, they like to move forward and, and do different things. So guess what? Hit them with different things, right? Like, don't just send phishing email attacks all the time, right? Like, like hit them with different things or engage them. Ask them, hey, we're doing a little program for like, you know, whatever, two weeks a month or one week a month. We're going to ask the Gen Z people if they want to learn a little bit more about information security, get them involved, make them security champions. You could take this program anywhere you want. But my point is... I don't care if it's millennials, Gen Z, Gen X, boomers, whatever it is, stop throwing shade at the gen because it's not your generation and just freaking uh, like like uh, take advantage of what it is that they are 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 into, right? Don't add friction. There's no reason to. You have the solution right here. This is the this is the lubricated solution. You want friction? Go the hard way. You want it smooth and and effective? Take advantage of this. Thank you. Thank you for joining my TED Talk. Fancy. Blue Sky hits the App Store. The decentralized social media protocol Blue Sky released an app on the iOS App Store meant to serve as a showcase for its authenticated transfer protocol. The protocol is backed by Twitter co-founder Jack Dorsey, who sits on its board. The service remains an invite-only beta, so you can download it, but likely can't use it. Right now, the app is pretty bare bones with a 256 character limit, support for uploading photos, but no direct messages. Given the rise of services built on the W3C standard activity pub, like Mastodon, it's not clear what future the protocol has if it doesn't interoperate. Interesting. Businesses grow. Very interesting. Okay, so let's play some music since that was the last story. There we go. So, obviously, um, if you just look at the community in general, okay... If you just watch the community in general, Twitter caught fire, right? Where's my man Elon? Let's do some of this, all right? So Twitter caught fire and people in our community, InfoSec community, fled to Mastodon, right? That's fine. So clearly the market is saying, we don't want Twitter. 
we want some alternative. And we went to Mastodon. Now, Mastodon is fine, but it's got a lot of shortcomings, right? And, and like, I'm not going to sit here and, like, grade Mastodon, but just it has a lot of shortcomings, okay? Twitter is a better user experience, and there's it's easier to find stuff and suggest it and all this other stuff. Okay, well, this, to me, indicates that there is a appetite for an competitor, an a, a enterprise-grade competitor to Twitter. This blue sky thing sounds like it's Mastodon done more professionally, frankly, okay? So when this thing hits... Um, it would be really interesting to see where this goes. Obviously, um, they're doing, uh, invite only in order to like probably work through the kinks, work through, build up some hype. You guys remember when clubhouse was, uh, invite only, and it was like the hotness and then it went public <laughs> and it kind of fell apart. Um, this is what blue sky is doing. So I have no doubt because Jack Dorsey's behind it, that it's going to get a lot of investment dollars. VCs right now, venture capitalists are actually taking less risk around investing in big tech companies, but Blue Sky is probably going to uh, push through that adversity. Uh, I would see where this goes. I might even speculate, little tinfoil hat here. Doink, 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 doink. Blue Sky could take off as the de facto platform uh, to basically unseat Twitter uh, and have all the benefit of Mastodon and uh, all the benefit of like Twitter with its professionalism and polish. Um, and that's why I think it could work. Okay. So stay tuned for some blue sky action. And if you got an invite, holler at me. I'd love to know what it's all about. All right. Now, if you were here just for the news, we are five minutes over. Apologies to base case in the NCC group uh, for that. Guys, guess what? It's Thursday, which means only one thing. We are rocking. Um, we're going to keep on rocking in the free world at 4.30 p.m. with my man, Charles Finfrock. You know him. I love him. I'm a crypto evangelist. I love it, love it, love it. Love it. Show and love to Tom Bishop and Kim for all their help. Thank you too, Gerald, and the LinkedIn Simply Cyber family. Much love, I heart NIST. Heck yeah. Thanks for the super chat, JoJo. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. All right. Charles Finfrock has been on the show multiple times. I've, I've had dinner with the guy multiple times. Um... I love I love me some Finn Frock. He's gonna come on. He's gonna be talking about uh, spy balloons and the country of origin of those spy balloons. He'll be talking about surveillance technology. Now, note, note, this is on YouTube only. This will not be on Twitch, Twitter, or LinkedIn. This will not be on LinkedIn. If you want to watch this stream, you have to come to YouTube today at 4:30. Um, I, I don't know what the rules are with like deplatforming and and. Uh, like shadow banning and stuff like that. But because of what we're going to be talking about, I, I just wanted to like hedge my bets a little bit and not have both LinkedIn and YouTube <laughs> in case there's, um, in case there's some issues. So you got to come on over to the YouTube sides. Okay. Jared loves sock two over nest. No, 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 Joe, Joe, Joe. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. I am all nest all the time. Erica McDuffie is your sock two person. I'm all nest all the time. So come over at 4.30 p.m., hang out with Finn Frock and me. It's going to be a good time. If you were here just for the news, I bid you farewell, and thank you very much for uh, spending your morning with us. I hope you got value. Hit the like button on your way out. I'm going to check my calendar really quickly to see if I have an 11 a.m. Eastern time. Um, what is this? I do have an 11 a.m., so I can only jaw jack for two more minutes. Um duty calls all right guys so really quickly uh team replay i'm thinking i think we could start team replay simply cyber community challenge on monday um here's what i'm thinking all right guys i'm going to create a discord channel for team replay simply cyber community challenge uh we will run two concurrent simply cyber community challenges okay or maybe i i don't know we could we could do um we could do it as one big one. Let's try it as two, and we'll call it the Team Replay Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Hashtag Team Replay. And we can use the Discord channel for the tagging, okay? We'll give it a shot. Let me know what you guys think. Um, I just, I want it, GR, I want Team Replay to be involved, but it, it is it is asynchronous, and it is a little challenging, so we're going to try to make it the best we can. Um, 
Can you post a link to the Mike Warner interview happening today? So we'll read Mike Warner. Um, there was a conflict on Mike Warner's schedule. So Mike Warner has been moved to April 6th. April 6th is when Mike Warner will be coming on, uh, which is one, two, three, four, five weeks from now. Finn Frock, he's a pinch hitter. He came in to pinch hit. Um, instead of doing no show tonight, uh, Finn Frock jumped on and said, I can do this. Let's roll. Can newcomers to your channel join the Simply Cyber Community Challenge? I'm new to your channel and trying to grow my network. Yes, Jordan Turney, you absolutely can. Uh, just show up every day. It's the, whoever, I don't control it. It's 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 gone from me now. So Chinadu will tag somebody in chat tomorrow. Um, Jordan, I would talk about growing your network. Even though you're not tagged, go to Chinadu's post today and comment on it. And everybody who goes to Chinadu's post, connect with each other on LinkedIn, right? So if you see Jordan there, connect with him. Jordan, I should be connected with you on LinkedIn. Let me know. Um, oh, good. Base case is going to help. We'll try to target team replay on Monday um, for the community challenge. Uh, me and the mod team are going to try to sort this out. All right. Yep. Yep. So anyone can use the hashtag. Absolutely. Um, we are trying to like the chain, like seven of seven was, uh, I think, um, Jack's eight of eight. Like, yeah, I mean, anyone can do it, but we're just trying to make it fun with like, you know, the tagging and all that. Uh, Tom Bishop brings up a good point. Go to the past posts as well uh, and do it. Gaming with the cat was up in there. Cat GPT. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. Shall we play Mike B asks, what's the hashtag? It's simply cyber community challenge. Doink. Looks like this. If you could see it on stream right now. All right. I do want to do Simply CyberCon. Yes, we will be talking about that. Potentially, potentially tomorrow. I, I can't I can't commit to the um, Simply Cyber Unfiltered show yet, uh, but we do have people who are uh, have stepped forward and want to help with Simply CyberCon, so stay tuned for that. Uh, trust me, I, it, I have not lost sight of it. It's just, I wish you guys could understand, like, I have a full-time job. I teach at Simply Cyber. I'm working on two different courses right now. I, uh, there's sponsorships. Um, I'm, 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 I've been working with uh, cyber ranges to develop labs for the Cyber 101 course. Like I've just got a lot going on. It's tough to just, like, it's tough to, to. Um, but simply CyberCon is on my radar. Don't, don't worry about that. Okay. And I got people helping me. All right. So that's gonna do it for today's stream. William Welch, my man. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Yes. Love it. Love it. Love it. Uh, we've got a great mod team um, and a great team in general behind Simply Cyber and uh, Simply Cyber Con. Um, there's already been some some ruminating going on around what we could do and how we could do it. Uh, Cody Kinsey has in 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 um, in good faith, I guess, or whatever you want to say, he's tentatively agreed to run a training on Simply CyberCon, so we're going to have access to that. You'll have to buy a Wi-Fi nugget. I told you. I told you guys uh, I would be getting one. So got myself a Wi-Fi nugget. I'm going to be playing with that. Have a great day, everyone. I got to boogie out of here. Yeah, I've been doing it. I've been doing it for three years, Scott. K. Okay, Scott Powell. It, it is a lot, man. All right, y'all. I got a boogie out of here. I've got work work to do. Uh, I'm going to be talking about cyber ranges in the future for Haiku Cyber Range Platform. You guys have been wonderful. I genuinely appreciate all of you. Have a great day. Take this information. Go forth. Do great things. And until the next time, stay secure. Yeah. <laughs>